this is the real title of a real movie that people really told a movie theater box office cashier they would like tickets for. I love how this movie felt the need to specifically single out a credit for scissor hands effects, as if scissor hands effects specialists might have to form a union one day. Oh, that's a long story, sweetheart. I wanna hear. Oh, not tonight, go to sleep. Since Grandma tells the story anyway, and there appears to be no reason for this little girl to go to sleep at this very moment, why does the movie waste our time with this banter? Can't Grandma just be like Peter Falk and the Princess Bride and just tell the f***ing story already, for f***'s sake? I guess it would have to start with scissors. Scissors? Wow, I can actually hear the ghost of regret calling out to me from 32 years ago in all the auditoriums across the world. It's saying, boo but not the scary boo. The kind you say when you're disappointed boo. And once there was even a man who had scissors for hands. This is spoken and we're all just supposed to go with it. Like no one asked how the f did that happen? Or was one of his parents a scissors? Or if you had scissors for hands, why wouldn't you be super worried about passing that gene onto your kid? Hands? Scissors? No, scissor hands. Edward Hands Scissors is a better movie by far, but that's what you get when you watch scissor hands propaganda like this. Couldn't they just have made grandma a better storyteller so the kid wouldn't ask so many questions right at the beginning? Did this kid's agent shake Tim Burton down so that their client could have more lines? You know the mansion on top of the mountain? No, I don't, old lady, because I'm f***ing four years old. He also created a man. He gave him insides, a heart, a brain, everything. A heart and a brain and everything? He didn't have a name? Of course he had a name. Good lord, I'm glad this five minutes of stumbling over a story about a guy with hand scissors is almost over and we can get to the part of the movie where we can just imagine the grandma is telling the story, but we don't have to hear her f it up so badly that the kid has to interrupt and ask questions every 10 seconds. Looks like Walter and Jesse are cooking a batch back here in this otherwise calm pastel subdivision. Vomino's pest strikes again. You know, you didn't have to call me, man. You could have taken care of this by yourself. Whoa, f I said I didn't want to hear Grandma telling her grandkid this story anymore, but now I want to hear her explaining why this woman called a plumber that she didn't need. She didn't need the plumber? Why? Well, sometimes women have needs. But I thought she said she didn't need the plumber. Well, she needed help with the plumbing, but not the dish. Well, let me start the story over. It was then that Peg discovered something sinister about this town. The trees she was driving towards were completely fake, and the castle atop the mountain appeared to be pasted on or keyed in to the background. Was I asleep? Had I slept? Being unable to sell any of her Avon products to the most likely customers, Peg thinks the creepy castle is a worthy long shot. She trespasses and walks down four stone steps into a throne room with a grand staircase, lots of cobwebs, and covered chairs, and she does not immediately retreat and go get a Frosty. She's obviously in some kind of giant clock robot distillery, and yet she is not freaking out. Is she a robot herself? I'm Peg Box. I'm your local Avon representative. This gives me the right to enter your house and climb your stairs, in case you were unaware of the power of Avon. Why are you hiding back there? And Peg gives zero f**ks about privacy. We're supposed to like this woman, right? Your father? He didn't wake up. So what happened when the inventor died? Was he still lying in bed waiting for a proper burial? If he was taken out of here, how was Edward not discovered? Or, or did Peg just show up on the exact day the inventor died? Doesn't really matter. Peg shows absolutely no concern over these things and asks no further questions. What happened to your face? Hm. Well, gee, lady, he's got scissor fingers. He's scratched happens. How are you this stupid? The real estate agent came armed with astringent and cotton balls, just in case she met someone with a bunch of face wounds. I think you should just come home with me. What the f***? Conclusions just called and wondered why you had just jumped to them while passing directly over Lake Common Sense and Logic Park. The f***? And he just goes home with her? This movie is bullshit. Slip and slides. And no, I'm not sending this because I am jealous due to the fact that I never had one of these myself. I'm sending it for Billy Pride, whose wicked slide was interrupted by the jagged tree limb the homeowners had failed to remove from their lawn, which led to quite the lawsuit and windfall for the Pride family, but ruined slip and slides for our entire town. Positioning your couch super close to the TV, but perpendicular to it so that no one has a good view. Despite having a garage, Peg chooses to park the car in the street so that Edward can walk to the house out in the open in front of all the gawking eyes of the neighborhood. Falling in love with a photograph. Those are grapes. Those are not f***ing grapes. I don't know enough about Edward to confidently say he's an asshole or not, but you'd think he'd know enough about his scissors not to poke and prod at which makes him a total asshole. This is just cruel. You know he has scissors for hands, goddammit. Either feed him or blend this up into a dinner smoothie he can suck through a straw. Christ, are you some kind of jerk face? 
Well, this must, this must be quite a change for you, right, Ed? Bill apparently shows no concern that his wife took in the stranger with scissors for hands. Is there a scene on the cutting room floor where Bill meets Edward for the first time? A discussion with his wife? I appreciate you wanting to cut straight to the whimsy, but is there any humanity in this sh- I guess this is hilarious. I just see meanness. You serve f***ing peas to a guy with scissors for hands. What a f***ing dick move. Jesus. Light him on fire while you're at it, maybe. The whole movie is beginning to feel like an overlong Saturday Night Live sketch. On the next episode of Edward Scissorhands, Edward tries out for the volleyball team. Edward, that was our last ball! Also, they totally missed out back in the day by not making an Edward Scissorhands, the demon barber of Elm Street crossover movie. You could have had Edward versus Freddy, and you'd also have the most famous Nightmare on Elm Street actor of all time returning in a different role, plus a completely unasked for reference to Sweeney Todd for kicks. I think about things like this when I'm watching a family starve a guy who doesn't have the ability to eat the food on the table. Can I bring show and tell on Monday? Thing Tim Burton said after meeting Johnny Depp somehow makes its way into the script. Okay, so he can pick up the napkin just fine to wipe his mouth, but he can't pick up any food items? Also, he didn't eat anything, so what is he wiping his mouth for? You think you can sleep? The f do you not think he slept before? Or are you asking if he can sleep in these circumstances? Did you mean more words include? I know there's a point to all these dudes going out to their cars and going golfing all at the same time. Probably something about how this neighborhood is boring and slavish to routine. However, the fact that everyone leaves the house at the same time is some bullshit. Have you ever tried to get a group of people together to do anything? Can't sync anything up. You'll always have people who are early and some who are late and some who say they'll be there, but instead end up playing, I don't know, Galaga? They end up playing Galaga. What's most interesting about this pastel subdivision is that I can clearly see a normal 80s subdivision of mostly white and gray houses at the top right of the screen. There's something disconcerting about how Peg takes Edward from his house, and the only things we've seen her do is dress him and apply makeup, while completely failing to feed him earlier. Everything seems to be about appearances, and absolutely nothing is about what he wants or feels. He's here as a joke prop or a sight gag, for the most part. I'll be done. You seem really impressed with Edward's destruction of property. Coincidental cheering. They filled the whole tape. Movie expects me to believe that all the nosy neighbors merely tried to call Peg instead of actually going over to her house and knocking on the door. Here is a man that will nitpick these bush sculptures while simultaneously watching TV 15 feet outside his back door, meaning he has run some kind of electricity out here to power the TV so he can watch it in the heat of the sun instead of inside where it's much cooler. Why would anyone trust someone this insane? This movie is a reverse version of The Burbs, a movie that explored the idea of nosy neighbors being the real monsters until the movie basically said, nah, they were right to be nosy. In this movie, the nosy neighbors are clearly antagonists and are clearly the ones who've been burning bodies in a furnace in the basement for years and getting away with it. Is the movie telling us this woman is an asshole supreme? Miles make with the f***ing apple jumper. He chopped up a bunch of lettuce, which is great, but did he ever wash or sanitize his finger blades? You just have to be yourself. That never worked out very well for me. The dancing cookie cutter feet are a nice idea, but if you slow it down, you'll see that it's total pandemonium in practice. I'm taking a sin off here for early Tim Burton, and I don't know if he had more say over Final Cut early on, or if he just started making more mainstream films as a byproduct of aging, but early Tim Burton f***ing rocks. Now we're back to the beginning, just before Vincent Price shows up, and I'm wondering how the cookie dough even gets in the bowl in the first place, since this giant globe's one job appears to be retrieving an egg and then holding it while it gets cracked. So where's the dough coming from? The movie's gonna show us this conveyor belt in operation twice, and we never see that part. Here's a backyard party where literally everyone is just standing around close to other people and no one is doing sh**. Play scissor paper stones with us. Cheating. Here the neighbor wives will swoon over Edward's scissor hands for some reason. And just think what a single snip could do. You mean completely disable or injure your erogenous zones? I can't believe I'm even saying this, but I think when you start fantasizing about actual scissors, you might be too horny. This goes against everything I believe, but here I am, saying it out loud. Now we'd like to invite you to our card game Friday night. Would you like that? Only thing is... You can't cut. Sure, this is a joke that is terrible and is recognized as terrible by the movie, but it's probably just a shade more terrible than the other scissor jokes that this movie has already used unironically. Force feeding. We're back to Vincent Price, whose role here is ill-defined, and I'm just sad. So sad I'm going to go to bed. I'm going to go to bed sad and I'm dreaming of sad things. Weird that Winona Ryder freaks out so much here, considering she's seen Stranger Things. Also, sure, Edward is poking the shit out of this waterbed here, but what did they do about the giant hole he poked into it earlier in the movie? They buy a whole new mattress, or were they able to patch it up? He didn't tell them about the leak, so I choose to believe the movie forgot that he already poked a hole in it. You know how I know this family doesn't have a cat? Those pyramid stacked shot glasses.
That is the exact same reaction my doctor has every time I tell him I've already diagnosed myself using the internet, which I keep doing because I really enjoy seeing the reaction. Look, if you're going to make lemonade this authentically and slowly, you should really sit down in that chair there and do it because this bending over shit is going to wreck the hell out of your back. As if you didn't already realize how terrible Joyce is, the movie also makes her cruel to animals. Apparently taking Edward out in public is considered a great idea. We all know Edward would get ET'd before recess if this happened in any other universe than Tim Burton's. How many globes does one classroom need? Apparently the answer is all of them. He's calling you, Kimba. I don't know how Anthony Michael Hall's body of work in the 80s led to him playing the exact kind of asshole who used to bully him in all those movies by 1990, but it's fucking weird, man. Bill, you know what Edward was telling me he had lunch at Jackie's today? Oh, f you. Why don't we ever get to hear Edward talk about things? Is it because the movie realizes if we get too much of him, we might not like him anymore? Kind of sucks that in this big moment in Edward's life where bored housewives are inviting him over to do yard work and perhaps seducing him, we don't hear what he has to say. You can't buy a car with cookies. I disagree. I don't believe this has actually been tested by you, sir. You're just saying sh but there are places that make milkshakes with gold in them that cost a thousand dollars. And there are used cars that work that cost only hundreds. So I believe it is theoretically possible to buy a car with cookies. They just have to be the right cookies or the fanciest cookies. And the seller of the car has to love fancy cookies. But I think it could be done. Maybe not at a dealership, but you didn't mention that in your declarative statement. I, I can't eat that. He, he used his hands. That's scissorist. So everybody keeps finding ways to capitalize on the new guy's weirdness, and I guess this movie is a metaphor for capitalism? That's a step up from Beetlejuice, which was a metaphor for irritable bowel syndrome. Have you ever cut a woman's hair? Would you cut mine? What about all the ladies in line with dogs, though? Why should this one lady get a two-for-one and make everyone else wait extra long? There is an actual scene in this movie where all the neighborhood women bring their dogs to Edward so that he can give them a stylish haircut. But then the women tell Edward, do me instead. This movie feels like Stranger in a Strange Land if Valentine Smith started a scissor cult instead of the Church of All Worlds. Hairgasms. Most people forget that Johnny Depp has actually played two demon barbers. That is not how scissors or locks work. Ah, sudden media attention. Have you ever thought of having corrective surgery or prosthetics? We're in the audience Q&A portion of this talk show, and apparently that wasn't one of the first questions asked by the host. Either that or this lady is being an asshole for asking it again. I'd like to meet him. You would? You've already been given that option by one of the neighborhood dads at the barbecue. The movie cut away before you answered because this movie hates you for some reason. But that's why it sucks that we haven't heard Edward's true feelings on any subject in this movie. We have to hear it now on some low-rent Donahue program. I wonder, do you have any plans to open your own beauty salon? Oh, there's an idea. Anyone else? Edward never answers this, but the host of this low-rent Mike Douglas show doesn't even wait for one before going fishing for more audience questions. Is there some special lady in your life? Ooh. So, wait, you're actually taking his stare to mean he's thinking of Kim? They barely interacted. There hasn't been one moment where Edward tried to talk to her awkwardly or did something that showed he cared. This stare has a better chance of being about Joyce than it does Kim. And here we are. Prospective business property is lit up and isn't even locked. I'm not saying this place says rob me, but it certainly says live in me and claim squatters rights. Did she come down here earlier, put this cassette in, and fast forward or play it to this exact moment? Or is the cassette just one aphrodisiac song after another so it doesn't matter where it is when she pushes play? And then she showed me the back room where she took all of her clothes off. I know Edward is naive, but in no meaningful way did Joyce take all her clothes off. What kind of monster puts crackers in their chili by tearing off tiny pieces of cracker one at a time instead of just smashing that shit in your fist and getting your grub on? Is there any reason the guards in the background are literally closing the vault right as the bank man closes the loan door on Edward? I mean, other than hating subtlety, of course. Here's the scene where Johnny B. Good tries to convince Reality Bites to steal his parents' stuff and sell it to pay for a f van with a mattress in the back, and she's only kind of resisting the idea. And that's f up a few ways. Well, can't you take the key like when he's sleeping or something? Look, you don't understand. The only thing he hangs out to tighter is his dick. So Anthony Michael Hall's dad has this room where he keeps all of his best electronics, a room that is locked at all times, and his dad always has the key, like he's a bailiff or some shit. Jim wants to sell his dad's stuff so he can afford a van where he can have sex with Winona Ryder anytime he wants to, and he's going to get Edward to pick the lock where the forehead VCR resides. He knows Edward can do this because of that scene earlier where Kim forgot her key or some total lie the movie made up so that Edward could show he can open locked doors. Anyway, what kind of bullshit plan is this? His dad is going to get robbed and the next day Jim's going to show up in a new car? Don't you want us to have our own van? 
the f fan argument is a lot more persuasive than I was expecting. We were told Jim's dad bought a big screen TV and some fancy VCR, but the movie doesn't want to show it for some reason. Don't get me wrong, this looks like a pretty cool place with a CD player and a rad stereo system, but if this room doesn't have a big screen TV, go f*** yourself, movie. He's got something in his hands. It looks like knives. Somehow these cops haven't heard the dude wandering around town with f***ing scissor hands, even though he's been all over the place. The mall, his daytime talk show, and let's not forget Kevin's super popular show and tell where all the big wigs go to be seen. Damn those TV programs. Damn them all to hell. I know this is a cynical take on parents blaming anyone but themselves, but I'm not sure we've ever seen Edward watching TV this whole movie. I mean, blame Joyce before you blame TV, you f***ers. Or did somebody put you up to this? It's kind of crazy that the guy who quite innocently told everyone that Joyce took her clothes off in front of him somehow knows to keep his mouth shut when it comes to narking. Like, I understand wanting to protect Kim, but Jim? And have I spent this whole movie not knowing they were Jim and Kim and not sent it? I warned you, didn't I? I saw the sign of Satan on him. This unwelcome religious lady has absolutely no bearing on what happens in this film and continues to be unwelcome. Peg continues to inexplicably park on the street instead of her own driveway and or garage so that the movie can create unnecessary complications for Edward. I tried to make Jim go back, but you can't make Jim do anything. For instance, try making him Jealousy vandalism. Edward decides to add destruction of property to his charges, which is a curious move. C, you give it to the poor. D, you turn it into the police. Dad, this is really stupid. Looks like we need to start calling Winona Ryder Sinona Ryder. Am I right? Am I right? Guys, am I right? You know, we had the coolest show and tell today. No, you didn't. You brought Edward f***ing Scissorhands to show and tell before today. How could this one be cooler? And is your school day just show and tell all the time? Who the f*** are these cookies for? Santa? She is alone in this house of all the lamps. Why did she put out a tray like she was expecting 20 guests? She wants yet another haircut from Eddie, even though she's already approaching Anne Hathaway's Les Mis do. The scene of him rapidly doing an ice sculpture would be a bit more magical for me if I could think of any way Edward could have ordered a block of ice the size of a large phone booth and paid for it and had it delivered and done all that without his host catching wind of any of it. As I watch Winona Ryder dance in the snow, I am reminded that this story is about where snow comes from, which means this is the longest f***ing story ever told about snow. A meteorologist could have explained this to the granddaughter by now, and if I'm a kid listening to this story, I'm wondering what all that sh** was with Joyce seducing Edward and the side story about him trying to steal a dude's electronics so that he could impress that dude's son's girlfriend. There's no way Edward is close enough to slice Kim's hand here. I know they've made Bill super oblivious to everything in this movie, but how did he miss the commotion down below, just a little to his right, when Edward sliced Kim's hand and Jim started yelling at him? It's upsetting that Edward wants to cut his human ties so much that he shreds his white shirt, but it's also hilarious how long it takes him to actually accomplish the feat. Killing your darlings. There's over candling, and then there's having a death wish. This is hilarious, but this is the same window Esmeralda was looking out earlier, and there was no bush directly in front of the window that Edward could carve up to do this. Hello, Mrs. Boggs, I'm here to see the man with the hands. Oh, sh Every time a cop comes to my door saying shit like this, they immediately start stripping. You know, when I brought Edward down here to live with us, I really didn't think things through. Listen, Peg, we've sinned this already, so don't try to somehow preempt one of our sins now because you're too goddamn late. This dick's been sitting out in someone's driveway with everyone, including the cops, looking for him, and no one's found him yet. Please. You have so many alleys you could hide in, and you decide to walk down the street. At this point, Edward's done hard time. He should f***ing know better. Man, she was wary as f*** about this dude before her boyfriend was mean to him one time. Now she is all in. We already know that the inventor was just about to give Edward his hands and he died before he could attach them, so this flashback has been robbed of its impact because the movie already spoiled this fact early in the film. So why didn't this movie just begin with the visual story of Edward instead of that fucking nonsense Princess Bride opening? Why did we need that fucking Princess Bride opening? I don't know how these hands were supposed to work, and you don't either. And luckily for the movie, it doesn't have to know. Maybe they were supposed to fuse with the Franken Bonds or the Pinocchio Balls or the Rihanna Depper. I'm not up to date on the lingo, but I'm pretty sure I'm close. To recap, this movie had Vincent Price and got him to do the following. Look at a weird cookie machine and get the idea for how to create a human life. Read Etiquette and a stupid poem to Edward. And now, just before he's about to give Edward his hands, he dies. You had Vincent Price movie. Michael Jackson's Thriller used him more than you did. Edward barely cuts the inventor with a couple scissor blades, but when he holds them up to his face, three blades are sopping with blood. Forget holding her hand. Picture the damage he could do other places. Picturing the damage he could do other places. Kevin.
Kevin is old enough to look both ways before crossing the street, and definitely hears this drunk driving van behind him, but he still tries to run across the street anyway, because this movie needs one final complication that adds even more complications when Edward's clumsy scissors cut Kevin the f*** up. Edward is already a wanted man for all the damage he did in the neighborhood before this. Don't think for a minute I've forgotten that shit just because he saves Kevin from getting run over here. I'm gonna send this movie for making it seem possible that Edward hasn't killed someone yet. I never thought I'd have a chance to use this again, but it was worth it then and it's worth it now. Anthony Michael Brawl. Guy who pummeled a guy with scissors for hands acts genuinely shocked when he is sliced. It is not legal for police officers to fire their guns into the air just to get attention. If the parallels to Frankenstein didn't seem clear to you, here's an angry mob about to walk up to the castle door. I'm shocked this isn't Halloween since there's more chance for pitchforks and torches in that case, but it's Christmas and everyone's left that shit at home. Okay, this rooftop fight where the roof is unfinished or caved in, where the protagonist, the love interest, and the antagonist all end up here together, Tim Burton absolutely recycled this from 1989's Batman. Did Jim seem like the kind of villain who would end up needing to get killed by the end of the movie? I mean, yes. Yeah, straight up asshole, no doubt, but nothing screamed out, man, someone is gonna have to end this fool by the end of this Christmas movie. Also, I think that's murder. You can see for yourselves. Absolutely no one in this mob wants to see for themselves. She shows them a scissor hand to prove Edward is dead when he's really alive, but does the crowd here think she sawed off dead Eddie's hand? Or that shit supposedly twist off or something? How'd she get the hand is what I think the people ought to be asking. She never saw him again, not after that night. How do you know? What a stupid fucking little kid. Were you not paying attention? You see, before he came down here, it never snowed. A fucking liar. Also, none of this bullshit would account for snow going through the entire fucking neighborhood. I hate this story. Eat a dick story. He said oil can. Oil can what? Mother, oh God, mother, blood. I'll get you, my pretty. A long time ago, an inventor lived in that mansion. I'm inventing mostly. Good morning, Joyce. Avon calling. Wait, you want us to sell Amway? You don't actually think I have any money, do you? Did you see how they were living? How can you delude yourself? We were wondering if we can borrow some brown sugar. Mirror. Mirror! I have some smocks. Would you like me to model them for you? Mrs. Robinson, you're trying to seduce me. <laughs> Aren't you? Oh, Edward, dear. I blame myself. So do I. This is the voice of experience talking. Are you listening? F*** a lot of women, Dwayne. Hey. Not just one woman. Dad. A lot of women. It's just a scratch, Jim. Just a flesh wound. They look like big, good, strong hands, don't they? I love you. Well, in Whoville, they say that the Grinch's small heart grew three sizes that day. But now you know there was a man named Jack Dawson, and that he saved me. He exists now only in my memory. <laughs> 